with their head up at the top of the bed. If they're not, I'm doing this, okay? My instruments are like this. So that's really important. Also, I may be positioning the head, and again, if they're too far down, that doesn't give me as much movement. Um, this dummy is very stiff. I may not be able to get everything into position um, the way I would want. Uh, but he at least gives us the opportunity to kind of see what's going on. The, there's two kinds of laryngoscopy that I'll, I or Dr. Lane or any of the ENTs will be doing. One is more refined work. It's trimming a vocal cord so that their voice is better. Um, that one will use more of the delicate instruments. The other is if we're looking for a cancer, biopsying a cancer, and then that tends to be more gross, uh, meaning large, not icky, um, but gross movements, large biopsies, trying to get biopsies down the throat that we can't do in the office. So, um, for starters, now I've moved this over so we have enough room that people can take a look if they want. Um, the mannequin is actually open on this side to see uh, the um, laryngoscope down. I am right-handed. I want my scrub on my right hand. She's going to um, hand the instruments and help me guide the instruments in, especially if I'm using this, because I can't see where the tip of the laryngoscope is um, in relation to the end of the instrument in relation to my hand. Um, should we go ahead and start? Sure. She's pretending, just so you guys know, normally you won't use a male stand, but he doesn't have a chest. So this is going to be the patient's chest. And then normally on the patient's chest, we'll go ahead and put this on here, this tray. Don't put a towel or anything because the lily will slide. It won't stay in place. And the reason for using this um, is that that way if the bed has to move, the head has to move, the laryngoscope goes with. The important thing I'm doing at the beginning is I don't want to knock his teeth out. So we're going to use a dental guard. Um, Those are on the front part on the top. Draping, we don't need to cover everything. This is a clean, not sterile procedure. Think of um, anesthesia insulating. Um, they don't have special drapes on or anything like that. Someone got the liver so I'm just going to use two towels to drape his head, um, cover his eyes so the instruments are not going to drip on him. So the set I opened up, it'll say, uh, the sheets over there, it's the JACO suspension, and then it says AKA DITO. That's the, the basic one that she's always going to use. The other one on the cart, it says the same, says the JACO suspension, but it's the Hollinger, which is just a little bit different. Uh, the Hollinger is too narrow. I want stereoscopic vision. This is larger opening so that I can, when I'm using this, both binoculars are uh, seeing the cords down at the bottom. You need two light sources. One of them is for the laryngoscope for putting it in. <laughs> and the other one, I hope you reach. Yeah, this is your laryngoscope <clears throat> cord. It's got just a little slot and it rotates, turns on, and locks onto the handle. This, this is called a pilling. If I'm asking for a pilling, and I don't know if you guys can see the slot alongside. I mean, you can see the light coming out. Normally, it's just coming out in that direction. Um, well, she's going to have a camera. Too. Too. Yeah. Um, I think that's as low as the male would go. Just raise the bed. Yeah, I can come down with the clothes. Do you want to put the chest rolls there instead? Do you want to put this on the chest rolls? Sure. That work okay?
down, you twist, and it slides out. There's a lot of slack. There's a little knob on the very tip. Push it in, twist. It'll go up, fall into the notch, and it'll fit easily. So two light sources. The one on this should be one of the side ones. The television camera and the scope needs to be on this one. It needs the brightest light to get the pictures, so it needs this light source over here. And this is the Limbatech cords. Those aren't up here anymore. They're in specialty care's cart that's in the hall here. When you open it up, they're kind of to the back on the right of the top shelf. But you want to make sure you get the one that's got the blue tape. There's some that have yellow. You can grab that, but then there's a little blue box next to it that has adapters that'll say light cord adapters, and they've got the blue tips that you can screw onto it instead to switch it out if you need it. Um, she doesn't like the light cord that lights up that comes with the camera because it glares off of the laryngoscope. So like the white light keeps me from looking inside. So, so let's show the different sections. Oh, okay. So, so light on or not? Or just keep it off? Can you turn it off? You can keep it off for a little bit. Do you have it on the scope to put on it? Yeah. Um, the main scope that she's going to use all the time is the, called the 30 degree Hopkins laryngoscope. There's a 30 and a 70 on the cart that are packaged separately. Then there is one set that'll say 30 and 70 degree laryngoscopes, and there's one of each in the box. Usually she only needs the 30, so that's what I always start with. It's easier to open up just the one and have it there than to keep processing two of them for no reason. So the um, um, other thing is the length. These laryngoscopes are not a substitute. They're too short. Sinoscopes are too short. Sinoscopes won't work. I'm going to give that to you. So, go ahead and take this off. This one. Oh, I'm hoping I could get him intubated because he's really, really stiff. I'm not going to use the mouth guard because there's not enough room to put this scope in. When I'm putting the scope in, I'm going along the side of the mouth, pushing the tongue to one side. Anesthesia has their tube taped off to the left. While she's doing that, I get the Louie, because it's called the Louie. I get that ready. You want to make sure that you have the arm lifted up so that it's away from the chest. So when I go to hook this on and she's ready, when they put it in the pan so that it'll fit, it's got to be flat. And then you want to make sure that you have your screw backed off all the way for your clamp so that you'll be able to slide it out. And then the other things that come in your pan, you're going to get a, a large biopsy cup force and you're going to get a straight thing and up, okay, in there. You're also supposed to get, this one isn't correct, but they're uh, what they call a, a velvet tip, or a velvet eye she'll call it. It's got a rounded tip, it's not, not got a sharp edge to it. There should be a short one and a longer one. So you have both of those. <clears throat> and then there's two controlled suctions that have the finger hole so that you can either make it stronger or not. Um, there's usually like a five and a six in the set. Um, we do have a smaller suction over, peel pack separately like a four if you need it. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Yeah. yeah. And then there's also on the cart that are peel pack, <coughs> the triangular graspers. You can pass these around if you want to see them. There's a left and a right. And a lot of times when she's trying to get a biopsy, she'll be able to grab a hold of that. She'll let you know which one she needs. It makes it easier for her to hold the specimen while she's... They're called sweethearts. <coughs> they look like a little heart at the end. Um, yeah, yep. <laughs> so once she gets ready, then you're going to line this up. There's a, a, a notch in the bottom, and the handle is groove the same way. So you just want to watch and slide it on and hold it in place. And on your top little plant part, there's a little notch, a V notch you'll see that's going to line up with the top. So you want to make sure you're not moving her laryngoscope while she's holding it. You're going to get this in place tight for her. And then she's going to go ahead and adjust this on the chest. <coughs> Um, so when I'm putting
putting that in, I'll often use the, what I call a velvet eye, children with velvet eye. I have to get saliva out of the throat. It's called a velvet eye because the assumption is not the tip, it's on the sides. So I can use it a little bit to push. Um, it's not going to jab or cause bleeding. Um, also, it has two holes, so it's not going to suck tissue in and be stuck. So the velvet eye is what I've used for putting this in. Um, once this is in, let's use the telescope. Now. So usually Fred is on the shoulder right here so that I can dab it, get my lens clean. And then I always have a five-in-one tubing connected to the suction also because it makes it flexible for her when she's trying to go in the mouth. The other's too rigid to try and just go straight in and it likes to tend to flop directly in front of where she's trying to look. So if you have the five-in-one tubing, it makes it a lot easier for her to use and see. So I... I take pictures beforehand. It's important to document where the polyp, the cancer, the nodule, the cyst, whatever it is. Um, it's kind of stiff. Normally I would have both vocal cords showing like a, a nice white V at the end. Um, need white balance before I take pictures. I take pictures. Um, different. Yeah different parts of the throat, I might just do um, the gross biopsies. These are the larger tips. They do cut, and I will, from my standpoint, from pathology, I want to give them as much tissue as possible. So if there's a big tumor, I'm going to take lots of bites. And if it's a little tumor, I might only take one bite. It's really important to get that specimen off. Usually have Telfa. So I usually take Telfa, cut it in postage stamp size, and then I take two of the um, the saline syringes from anesthesia and put it in a cup so you have that on the field because you don't need that big huge bottle; it's a waste. Um, and then you moisten your Telfas so that they're ready for the specimen. The biggest thing is when she gives you a specimen, you don't want to grab it and squeeze it. You want to use an 18 gauge hypo and scoop it out of the biopsy cup because you can actually damage the cells by trying to grab it and squeeze it. So usually when she takes her specimen, I get my, I get my towel and I come right over here on the towel here and have it ready to go so that when she comes out, she can lay it right there and I can take it out of the towel. right on the towel and then, I'll do this yeah. so she can scrape it out. Um, the towel is moist so the specimen doesn't dry out. And it's okay, you have the postage size pieces, you can put, you know, take a specimen, go ahead and put it in the formalin and take another one as long as it's still biopsying the right the same, same site. You can put two, three little pieces of telco with specimen into the jar. Um, I'll, I should let you know, or if you're not sure if it's been a, you know, I've done a biopsy and there's a long space in there, you may want to confirm it's the same spot that I'm, I'm doing a biopsy. Um, but, the telfa keeps it moist, it's got to be saline, water will change the cells, fluid content will change the picture, will change the pathology. Almost always they're sent permanent. I won't say every single time, but because some of the specimens are so small, um, they don't have enough to freeze, so that's important. Um, so if I'm switching to the microscope, I have it on the left. I like it so I can move it. I'll usually do the setup. It's conveniently placed in front of all your tubes. That was sarcastic. <laughs> the other thing I usually have in here I didn't get was normally I always have a basin of water, of course. And then I also have the half by half conchoids, and you want to have the epinephrine 1 to 1,000 on your field. I usually have a little 3 cc syringe. Um, reason being is sometimes when she takes a biopsy, depending on what kind of biopsy it is, sometimes they want to bleed more than others, so she may ask you for a cotinoid with a little bit of epi on it. You use one of your graspers. Um, if you're not using the micro set, you can just use your biopsy cup 
grab it with that, hand it to her, so at least that would let it sit for a few minutes and get the bleeding to stop, bring it back out and give it to her. So the binocular vision, I'm going to line it up so that I can see the vocal cords with both. And when I'm looking down here, with the 30 degree, I'm going to the end of my tube and looking up. So when I'm looking through the microscope, it might not show. So sometimes I'm going to need you to push down on the larynx to give me a view. And you'll be able to see, because she'll usually have the scope in one hand, <clears throat> and then she'll take her instrument in the other. So like if she'll tell me to push, I'll know where the nodule is, because you'll be able to see it when you push. You'll be able to look on the screen to see, so you can get it into view. There'll be at least one, but you can also bring yeah. the other one in you know, around here, so the scrub can see. Um, so for down here, we're going to switch to a smaller suction. And usually, yeah, but the black is nice, it doesn't reflect. Um, then the other thing is, at this point, it's when we would either ask for a sweetheart, um, an alligator, there's right and left biting on almost everything. Um, if I was taking a polyp off, I'd probably use a sweetheart and then use an upbiting scissor to cut the mucosa uh, along the length of the vocal cord. Um, I might do two cords, I might just do one. Um, those are the specimens off the cord, they're really small. Those are the ones you want to be as delicate as possible, no squishing. Um, You'll usually, I mean, if you look on the scope when I, on the camera when I'm taking pictures, you can tell whether it's a polyp or cancer. Cancer is ugly and polyps are smooth. So you'll kind of know ahead and of course I'll say what I'm expecting. Um, at that point I might, you know, once I've done my biopsies, I almost always put epinephrine pledges on it so it's not bleeding that much. That way when anesthesia takes out their tube, um, it's not going to rile up the, the bleeding and have problems um, in the throat after they've extirpated. Um, at the end, do you think there's anything else? No, basically, just you guys, you guys can take a look at the microscope when, when we get done here. But basically, like she said, you've got you've got your alligator dressers, you've got a straight left and a right. Perhaps you have forceps that are in here, you've got a straight. The left, the right, and up. Yeah, um, I hardly ever use a biopsy. Same thing. I hardly ever use a biopsy so. forcep on a cord. It's just a little too uncontrolled. The scissors, the sweetheart, the alligator. The alligator's nice for putting the pledges, pledges down now. And then Those are the most common. The blades, too, in case they want the blades for the handle that's always in here. Um, it's, just, it's just by friction, so you slide it in. And when they close the handle, that's what holds this in place, so they know that. So they may want it's one of the different. There's like a single, straight, couple different ones, depending on what they're cutting. If they want that instead of a scissor. Does anyone have any questions? Um, if people want, they can use a cell phone to take pictures. You may want to look over here and see where I'm at down in the throat, because the mannequin's open. At the end of the procedure, I'll just push this out of the way. I'll take the laryngoscope out, check his lip that it's not pinched, um, and at that point, we'll turn the bed back to anesthesia to be Okay? Thanks for coming, you guys. I, I hope that makes sense.